Have you ever wondered how a straw works? How you get liquid up from, the, from your glass up into your mouth? The reason why a straw works is because there's one atmosphere of pressure pushing down on the surface of the liquid, but as you suck on the end of the straw, you're removing some of the gas particles that are inside the straw, and in response to the fact that there's one atmosphere of pressure pushing on one side and less than one atmosphere pushing on the other side, the liquid goes up the straw. So on, your, on the mouth side, oops, pushing down here, less than one atmosphere. Now, to show you that this actually is the way a straw works, because the atmosphere is finite, it has, only has so much weight, there's only so much pressure that it can exert, what that suggests is that you should only be able to pull liquid up a straw a certain height and no higher, even if you've got an absolute perfect vacuum up at your mouth, because the atmospheric pressure is finite, you'd only be able to push liquid up so far. And that's exactly what happens. If we imagine a glass on the ground and you had a really special straw, that special straw, 32 feet long, that's as high, as a, column of, that's as high a column of water you could raise at sea level where atmospheric pressure was pushing down on the top of the cup. Okay? So push down here, raise a column of 32 feet of water and no higher. Where this comes into play is if you happen to be using well water, in order to pump the water out from the well, if you just pump it by sucking at the top of the well, you can only raise a column of water 32 feet. So if your well is 35 feet, you're out of luck. Well, 32 feet is a little inconvenient for our laboratory. So let's repeat this experiment using a more dense liquid instead of water, and then we'll get to a more reasonable size. And that dense liquid that we're going to use is mercury. Uh, mercury, you know, is a metallic liquid. And if we repeat that experiment, here's a pan of mercury, here's a glass column. We're going to create a perfect vacuum here up at the top. And the weight of the air pushing down atmospheric pressure will allow us to raise a column of mercury 760 millimeters high. And we're going to give the millimeter a special name. We're going to call it the Tor, after Evangelista Torricelli, who invented the mercury barometer. OK, so this. 760 at atmospheric pressure is, in fact, how some people, uh, how, how meteorologists, when they talk about barometric pressure, the height here is going to change a little bit from day to day because the weight of the air changes from day to day. And so by watching the height changes at the, le at the level of this mercury, we can learn whether or not, for instance, if the pressure is high, we're probably going to have really clear weather. And if the pressure is dropping, the atmospheric pressure is dropping, so this column is going to drop, that's going to mean that we're going to have very changeable weather. How are we going to relate this kind of device to a sample of gas that we'd like to measure for maybe doing an experiment? And the answer is, we're going to use something called an open-end manometer. And uh, I've sketched a couple here. Open-end manometer is a glass tube. This is where our sample is going to go. We put some mercury in the bottom here. There's, since it's open to the atmosphere, there's one atmosphere of pressure pushing down uh, at sea level. And if we imagine that the other side is open, then there's also one atmosphere pushing on the left-hand side, and the two levels of mercury are exactly balanced. If we imagine closing off this piece of glass on the, right, the left-hand side, if the two levels of mercury are still exactly the same, then what we're going to say is we have one atmosphere of pressure of gas on the left-hand side. Well, what if we have something other than one atmosphere? For instance, if we have a little more than one atmosphere, then this is what the open-end manometer is going to look like. Because we have more gas on the left-hand side, it's pushing down a little bit harder on the mercury, so it unbalances the levels. And what we can do is we can measure the height on the left-hand side, the height on the right-hand side, and relate them by this quantity h. And what we're going to say is that the pressure of the gas on the inside is equal to 760, that's our atmospheric pressure, plus h, where h is this height difference in Tor. And it's also the case that if we express it in atmospheres, then the pressure of the gas on the inside is 1 plus h over 760 atmospheres. Now, Tor and atmospheres are two units that you're probably going to see a lot, but there are some other units of pressure uh, that people talk about. Um, physicists in particular use SI units, and the SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, 
one atmosphere is equal to approximately 1.013 times 10 to the fifth pascals. So obviously a pascal is a very small unit, and a unit related to that is the bar, and a bar is 10 to the fifth pascals. So one atmosphere is equal to 1.013, approximately 1.013 bars. And then I said before that this atmosphere is also 14.7 pounds per square inch. So we can easily solve a problem such as, what is the pressure in tor that corresponds to two and a half atmospheres? And the reason why I chose two and a half atmospheres is that that's approximately the pressure of carbon dioxide that's on top of uh, a bottle of soda just before you open it. So if you probably notice when you take the lid off, there's a, a sound of gas escaping from the bottle. That's the car excess carbon dioxide. So we can relate our pressure in tor to pressure in atmospheres by multiplying by one of our units of one, a unit of one, 760 tor over one atmosphere. Again, we choose it this way because we want the units of atmospheres to cancel. And so if we plug in our two and a half atmospheres times 760 tor over one atmosphere, we get 1900 tor. So what have we talked about here? We've talked about the fact that gases uh, are a little different from liquids and solids because they take up a lot of space. They are uh, in uh, motion with some with really high velocity. We described volume, which is a characteristic of a gas that we have to specify when we're describing our sample. And then we got into this concept of pressure. We talked about how the weight of the atmosphere creates pressure on all of us, uh, enough to crush a big, strong steel can. And then we talked about the open-end manometer, which allowed us to relate the pressure of a sample of gas that we might be interested in to uh, the atmospheric pressure. And finally, we, we talked about several different units of pressure and showed how we can, in one case, or in this case, how we can relate units of pressure simply by multiplying by units of one.